My name is Dr. LaFleur Schaefer, and I am an associate professor in the College of Education, Health, and Human Services at the University of Michigan Dearborn. I was tasked with looking at chapter six from How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kenyet, and this chapter was titled Body. As I said, the University of Michigan Dearborn is engaging in a community read of how to be an anti-racist. When I was approached, or I should say emailed, in taking part of this exercise, I was extremely hesitant. I prepare early childhood special education teachers and early childhood teachers, and that's the area that I predominantly teach my courses in. However, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that racism really begins with um, the thoughts and misperceptions of individuals, and that can be imposed on even the youngest of our society. Therefore, I chose to participate in this exercise in order to really think about how those um, misperceptions and those thoughts may be ingrained in some um, educators um, and what could I do in order to change that perception of pre-service teachers who may be going into environments where they may have they may be influenced by others with those perceptions if they do not hold them already. So um, as I stated previously I wasn't quite sure about um, taking part of this I really started with hesitancy. However, when I started reading chapter one, it completely captured my attention, hook, line, and sinker. Um, you will enjoy reading not only chapter one, but the entire book, and I highly encourage you to do so. Chapter, chapter six brings us to thinking about an aspect, an aspect of racism from a bodily perspective. It begins with defining two terms bodily racist and bodily anti-racist. And I'm just gonna read these two definitions that are presented in the book. Bodily racist is one who is perceiving certain racialized bodies as more animal-like and violent than others. Bodily anti-racist is one who is humanizing, deracializing, and individualizing non-violent and violent behavior. So what the heck is that. From my perspective, that is seeing each and every person as the human being they are. As quoted by Maya Angelou, we are all human. Therefore, nothing human can be alien to us. In the chapter, Kende really talks about how African Americans are perceived. And if we think about that term, bodily racist, if we are all human, how can we be perceived as more animal-like and more violent? How can we as humans be alien to other humans if we are all one human race? One of the concepts that Kende brings forth is this idea of labeling the actions and behaviors to certain racial groups because of the actions and behaviors of one person. For example, as indicated in this first image right here, in the past, many Asians were always thought to be good at math. If you were of Asian descent, then you should be really, really good at math. Another misperception is that all black people can dance. And we know that this is not true. Just want to let everybody know that um, we do not have the Michael Jackson dance gene. There is no dance gene, as a matter of fact. There's human DNA, and we are all made up of variations of genetic code that make us who we are. Nonetheless, in our society, we group a body of people based on behaviors that are not carried by the entire group. 
The author gives examples from history and of his lived experiences throughout the chapter. One that resonated with me was this fear, fear of black people, fear of black males. George Washington Carver once said, fear of something is at the root of hate for others and hate within will eventually destroy the hater. And so if fear is something that comes forth from another racial group, by another racial group, that fear eventually leads to hate. And I think that's one of the things that we continually see in societies where there is this determination that one racial group is superior to another racial group and making that racial group inferior. And one of the ways that we've seen throughout history that especially people of color have been deemed inferior is through fear. And that fear brings forth hate and hateful actions and um, policies specifically that negatively impact that racial group. The fear that has been cultivated over centuries continues today. Even the youngest of black males are perceived as a danger or sometimes it's, that danger can be displayed through what has been identified as quote unquote challenging behavior. When we think about our youngest children, our youngest children, especially um, young African American males and other people of color, you know, how has the institutions across the United States really put policies and programs in place to make them successful? And if we look at the programs and policies that are in place, it's actually doing the opposite. Why is this opposite? these opposite actions, you know, put in place. Is it fear of too many African Americans in the movie industry? Is it fear of too many African Americans in legislation? Is it fear of too many African Americans in the healthcare industry becoming doctors? Is it fear of African Americans becoming too educated? Is it fear of African Americans becoming leaders of our country. One of the institutional systems that are in place is this pro progression of the youngest African American males being designated as those that will soon be in our prison system, also known as the school to prison pipeline or preschool to prison pipeline. The idea that black males behavior is an automatic pr prison sentence is a negative outcome that they must run from, whether or not they know that they are in this race. If you're a three-year-old or a two-year-old young African-American boy, you may not even know that there's things that are already stacked against you, things that are stacked against you from the community programs from the institutional systems, such as school, that are already in place. How can we learn to know ourselves when we have to run from the danger that may impact us from destroying ourselves? In this race that Black males are in, you know, eventually they realize that they are in this race. They realize how far behind they are and their thoughts of themselves and their fellow brothers have already been inundated with negativity from society. So where do they go from there when there's both internal and external racism? In chapter six, Kende states, I was being stalked inside my own head by racist ideas. So my question is, 
and there's there's several of them. How does one run from the internal bodily racist ideas that they may have? How do these external racist ideas of society impact the individual black male, the individual black female? What is the psychological impact that these racist ideas have on the individual black male and female? One of the things that I challenge our campus to do is to look to your own thoughts and interactions with students that are on campus. Do you hold bodily racist ideas? Do your students? How do you, how do we move towards seeing each other as a person, as the individual human being that we are? We must account for our own behavior not the behavior of any group that we've been assigned to. How do we stand up for those who continue to be plagued by the violence of the racism that has been set on the black body? As for me, I've decided to continue to teach. Teach the pre-service teachers to see the individual child and the qualities they bring to the classroom. Teach them to see the potential in every child. Teach them to see their contribution to the outcome of each child they interact with based on how they see them. Teach them to be anti-racist. Thank you, and I really do hope that you enjoy reading How to Be an Anti-Racist by, um, by Ken Day. It is a great book. Uh, though that this is a different approach that I will have to take with my students, I do plan on utilizing the knowledge that I've gained from this textbook in order to help better prepare the students for teaching young children in early childhood classrooms and in early childhood schools. Thanks.